Thank you. Uh, I think we also need to give an applause to our MCs. I could not do their job. So I'm gonna start with a joke, because I love dead jokes and I'm a dad. So how do functions break up? They stop calling each other. And it's actually a relevant joke, because we're gonna show you how the functions break up in this presentation. So hi, I'm Mishko Heveri. Uh, you might know me because I've done this thing called AngularJS. Now I'm working on this thing called Quick, and I'm a CTO at Builder.io. Hopefully you've heard of Builder.io. Builder.io is a headless visual CMS system. What it is is you imagine Wix, but not hosted. Instead, npm install inside of your application. Uh, you drag it in, and then you get uh, visual editing. And you can also, because it's your application, you can register your own components with it and have your marketing people go wild. And they don't have to bug you, the engineer, about changing anything on their landing pages. Now, we do other things too. Uh, we do quick, but we also have this thing called Party Town, which moves third party code into web workers. And we do Mitosis, which allows you to write your code once. And we generate canonical code for React, Angular, Vue, Swelt, and anything else that you can possibly imagine. But let's talk about performance. So uh, this is kind of a typical randomly selected set of websites from the web. And notice they're all kind of green, maybe some in yellow. It really isn't looking that good. Um, why is that? You know, if you build a simple Hello World app and you push it somewhere, it, the performance is great. But once you put real uh, application, you know, real traffic behind it, the performance doesn't go so well. And there's a lot of different reasons for it, but one thing I'm really gonna try to convince you of is that it is JavaScript, and basically too much of it. And if you look at it, this is a chart from uh, HTTP Archive. This is the amount of JavaScript that we have been sending to our browsers over time. And as you can see, that's just going up, up, up. And I'm going to make a bet that in the future, there's even going to be even more JavaScript. And it totally makes sense, because our users experience, ex expect complicated, rich applications. And you cannot deliver complex applications without JavaScript. And so we need JavaScript. You know, There isn't a world where we stop shipping JavaScript. Or is there? So this is another interesting graph from HTTP Archive. I've selected a few frameworks here. This is really not important. But what I want to show you here is that the, the median score that a website gets and the amount of JavaScript that's being shipped are essentially inverse of each other, right? The more JavaScript you ship, the lower your Lighthouse score. And the less JavaScript you ship, the better your Lighthouse score. That shouldn't be surprising. This should be like self-evident, right? That the less JavaScript you ship, the better the thing will be. The problem is that the way our applications work is we have this thing called hydration. And hydration is this interesting workaround we have created and is creating this problem. So let me explain. Back in the day, before we had meta frameworks like Next.js, the way the applications would boot is we would send HTML. The HTML would be empty. And into the HTML, there'll be a script tag that would load JavaScript. JavaScript would then execute your application. The application will cause a render. And then the render would make a website. And now you can interact with the website. But we said, you know what? We really don't like the fact that there is this white screen there for several seconds. We really want to get rid of that. So we said, you know what? We know the solution to that. We're just going to go server-side pre-rendering. So, we sent now a bigger HTML. Notice the HTML got bigger. And now the page isn't white. It's the actual application that you have. But what, guess what? You cannot click on it. It appears faster, which is great. But you can't have any interactivity on that page yet. So at this point, we download the JavaScript, execute the application. We're no longer calling it render. We're now calling it reconciliation or hydration. But really, it's the same exact thing. It's just we're reusing the DOM nodes. And then we essentially end up with the same exact page, and only now can you click on it. And so this is actually slower, because notice the whole thing got shifted. So it appears faster, but the interactivity is actually a little uh, less. And the reason why it's actually slower is because we're sending the same information twice, once as an HTML, and then again as JavaScript. If you look into a string that says, let's say, hello world, the hello world is going to appear once in the HTML, and once in the JavaScript. And so the way hydration works is you start with the root component over here, and then you go and visit all the other children. And what you're really looking for are these red boxes. These red boxes represent the events. You need to know where are the click listeners, 
right? And this is a huge amount of code to download and execute. And so people are exploring different things. Maybe we should do partial hydration instead of having one big tree. Maybe we can have a bunch of small islands or delay it, et cetera. And that certainly improves the situation. It gets better. Or maybe we should do something like React Server Components, where we say some of the roots end up on a server, but the children will continue to be in the client world. But at the end of the day, what you really want is to get hold of these listeners. The listeners are the key to making your page interactive. And so I would like to show you an alternative world, or a world which I call resumability. So you start with HTML, and the HTML contains, well, the page, just as before. But there's a huge difference in here, is that this uh, page contains information about where the listeners are. And as a result, you can immediately click on it, interact it. In other words, the moment a button shows up, it is ready to be clicked on and interacted with. But you don't have JavaScript yet, so you have to download that. And in this particular case, notice the JavaScript is much, much smaller. Why is that? Well. Uh, what's missing over here? I'll explain in a second because, well, we removed the duplicates. We know, we looked at the page and we said, actually, that hello world that you printed, that's static. It will never have to be really re rendered again on the client, so why are we sending this across, right? And then, of course, we don't, as a result, because the HTML is not there, we don't have to execute the application, we don't have to reconcile the application, and so your application not only shows up faster, it is fundamentally quicker to interact with. And so this is the bit we call resumability. And so the thing is, in resumable world, instead of starting at the root component and then you know, finding all the listeners, you actually flip it all around and you say, no, no, you start at the listeners. And it's the listeners that matter. Because if there is no listener, then that component is, is, is in, uh, uh, inert. You can't really do anything with it. And so in this particular example, for example, if I click on this component, I see that only this particular component needs to be rendered, so the rest of the page doesn't even have to be downloaded. And so the key over here is that uh, by starting with the listeners rather than from the root, your application automatically breaks up into smaller chunks. So even if you have the most complicated application in the world, if you click the Add Buy button, the only thing you have to do is talk to the shopping cart and re-render the shopping cart. The fact that you have a complicated menu or the complicated component or the complicated um, way of commenting on the product doesn't matter. It is irrelevant to what the user is trying to uh, achieve. And so uh, I'm sure you've heard this, which is pretty much your optimization is the root of all evil. But why? Why is this comment there? And the reason is because clean code is, uh, uh, is simple code. Whereas fast code is complicated. What you're trading when you make something fast is you're trading simplicity for something that's complicated. And of course, we as humans, we write code primarily for other humans, right? And so what we want to have is a system where I can write clean code, but the computer can go and optimize everything for me, right? I want the computer to do the hard bit, and we already have that. We have compilers and linters and all kinds of magical things, and they do all kinds of optimizations so that we can continue looking at a pretty clean code, and we don't have to bother our brain with the, with the optimizations in there. So how can we have an application like that? And so the way most people build apps is you start with building an app, and then some of us actually get to the next phase and realize that our application is slow. And even fewer of us are actually doing something about this, right? Because optimization is hard. Optimization is not a single bug. It's something that creeps on you over time. And so the question is, what can we change? Well, what if I told you that you can learn two new concepts? One concept is signal. I think Ryan talked about it earlier today. He's known as the signal CEO. And the second one is code extraction. And code extraction is denoted here as a dollar sign with parentheses. What if these two things would allow the compiler to give you a startup performance that's constant, meaning it doesn't matter how big your application gets, it's always a startup of O of 1. There's always the same amount of JavaScript before you, need to, before you can interact. What if you can get lazy loading out of the box without any sort of effort? And what if you could get lazy execution without any sort of effort at all? That is an optimization that's not premature in the sense that the human doesn't have to do it. The code remains clean, yet the compiler can do it. But the compiler can only do it if we give the compiler the right set of tools. And so these tools are important, and that's why signals and code, um, code extractions are the kind of the key parts to it. 
So when you give this to the compiler, then the compiler can give you a best possible developer experience, and the computer can go and optimize it and do all of this uh, magic of lazy loading and, and making sure that only the minimum amount of code gets written. So that's the theory. Let me show you something in practice. OK, here I have an example for you. Actually, let's, let's look at the code first. So here is a simple uh, uh, application, a simple demo that I have built for, for these purposes. Notice it looks very much like React. And that's not an accident. That's intentional. Also notice that every once in a while, there is a dollar sign present. And that's basically the thing that allows us to do lazy loading, code extractions, et cetera. And so what I've done is I made sure that every component announces when it's rendered. It says, rendering app or whatever you have here. And then here I have hello, counter, clock, and RPC, the different demos that I am going to go through uh, today. So let's go through hello first. So hello component says, hey, first of all, I'm going to tell you that I'm being rendered. So I'm going to say console log. And I'm just going to have a button on it. And the button on it's going to have a console log when I'm going to click on it. And I'm just going to say hello, JS Nation, right? So let's run the first thing. So let's go to our application. Um, let's refresh it and notice that there is no JavaScript being downloaded, right? I'm looking at the JavaScript, no JavaScript being downloaded. So if I go and I click on hello, notice it is at that point that JavaScript shows up and hello JS Nation shows up, right? So as a developer, I have given my intention. My intention was I want a component with this listener. And the framework was able to do the magic. Now notice what got downloaded. What got downloaded was literally just console log JS Nation, nothing else. The system, with the help of these dollar signs, was able to look at the whole problem and say, ah, you just need the console log, and you don't need anything else to achieve what you want. So why are we sending the whole application across? That's unnecessary. I'm just going to send the thing that you actually need. Now, at this point, a lot of people will say, hey, I know what's going to happen. You're going to be in a slow network. You're going to click on something, and you're going to have to wait forever. So let me show you another important bit. This thing, notice in the size, I know it's hard to see, it says service worker. This was a cache hit. So the way it actually works is that when you navigate to a page, the service worker wakes up and immediately starts downloading all the necessary code and pre-populates the cache so that when you go and click, the, the virtual machine, the, the V8, will go and fetch the data out of the cache. It's going to be a cache hit. And therefore, you will not uh, have any kind of delay, even on slow and unreliable networks. You know, If you load the page before you enter the tunnel, the page will continue working when you are in the tunnel. Um, OK, so the, how, do this, how does this magic work? Well, the thing is, the system can realize that, hey, in order to click this button, I have to execute this code. But the problem is, how do I get a hold of this? In order for the, the, the JavaScript to execute some code, there has to be a top-level export. Somebody somewhere had to do basically this piece of code right here, right? And so this is what code extraction does. This dollar sign right here basically tells the system, I want you to extract it and put it into a top-level thing that I can import it. And because I can import it now, it can be executed by itself without any sort of um, rest of the system being available. But you know what? You're going to say, well, yeah, but look, this console.log doesn't close over anything. In reality, our buttons close over state and other things. So let me show you a slightly more complicated example, which is the counter. Let me, um, I'm going to switch over to a different tab where I'm running in the dev mode because I want to show you things uh, kind of more down to, to grain because I don't want to necessarily show you the uh, service worker. So it's the same exact demo. It's just running in a dev mode. So notice what downloaded. When I d uh, hit plus one, I downloaded some code that did the incrementation. I downloaded the framework. And finally, I downloaded some build thing that's, that's not really important. But this is the important bit, right? I've downloaded a piece of code that incremented the counter. So let's look at the implementation of this. Now, the counter is intentionally pretty complicated because I want to show off important things. When you, normally, when you see a counter, you see a single component that does both the buttons and the rendering and the state. Intentionally here, I am going to break things up because I want to have as many components involved in here as possible because I want to show you the power of optimization that Quick can do. So here is your counter. First of all, I'm going to tell you that counter is being rendered. I'm going to create a state, and in this case, in Quick, it's called a signal. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the signal and give it to an incrementer, which is essentially just a button that knows how to increment the thing. And I'm going to give the value to the display wrapper, which again knows how to render it. The reason I'm breaking it up is I want to show you a hierarchy of components. So I'm just making it kind of complicated instead. Display wrapper doesn't really do anything. It simply takes the value and passes it on to display. What I want to show here is a typical example of prop drilling, right? A component that by itself doesn't do anything useful. It just passes the value down. And finally, we have our display that shows the count. And we have our incrementer, which is just a button and gets a hold of the count and does count dot value plus plus, right? So I know it's overly simplified, but fundamentally, that's what a web application is, right? You have a place where you keep your state. You have a place where you show the state. You have a place where you mutate the state. And you probably have a bunch of unrelated components that just do prop drilling in order to get the UI that you want. Now, when this happens in the normal world and you go and modify the count, if you're in the, in the React world, you would expect that all these console logs would rerun and re-render and reprint. Let me show you what actually happens here. So let's hit plus one. Notice it worked. It did plus one. What we downloaded was just this listener, right? Just this piece of code right here. Just this, nothing else. Then the framework showed up. And of course, this build file that is not important. Notice what didn't show up. None of the components showed up, right? The fact that a state was in one component and we prop drilled, et cetera, in the console log, there is nothing in here. And also inside of the source code, we didn't even bother sending it. Really, the only thing we sent was this piece of code that was the thing that did the mutation. Everything else is unnecessary. Why? Because signals allow you to connect directly to the DOM. When this piece of code executed on a server, the server learned about the relationship of the components, and it learned that, like, oh, this signal is connected to this piece of DOM over here. So when I increment this value, I really just have to increment, you know, update the DOM over here, and everything else is irrelevant. It's just noise. And so sending it to the client would be problematic. And so it doesn't get sent. OK, let me show you a next thing. What if I have a clock? A clock only shows up when you scroll into it. Notice the clock is running. Let me show this again for you. I have no JavaScript. Scroll the clock into the position. When the clock shows up, the JavaScript shows up, and it starts running. What exactly does the clock do? Well, there is a use visible task, which you can think of as use effect. Use effect runs on hydration. But there is no hydration. So when exactly are we supposed to run something like that? Well, the answer is you run it when the component becomes visible. And so this piece of code naturally does what you would expect. But it has an added interesting behavior, which is like, hey, if the component isn't visible, why even bother downloading or executing or doing anything like that? And so finally, let me show you one more interesting thing. We have a button here that says do something, and I'm going to flip over to the console log. And this do something says, hey, I'm going to do work. I'm going to do some expensive work, and I'm going to return some value. Let me show this to you in here. So there's an RPC component. It says render. There is a click button that says, hey, oops, I am going to do the work. I'm going to just create some date. And I'm going to create a function that says do work. And I'm going to pretend this is the expensive work. And I'm, just for fun, I'm going to return a, a function that actually has a value. Typical thing you do, you return closures and pass things around, right? And so obviously, all of this thing happens on the browser because, well, it's on a browser. It's a click listener, right? But what if I can do crazy magic like this? Just simply say server. And all of a sudden, if I refresh and I click the button, notice the clink was on a client, the return value is on a client, but the expensive work, well, that showed up on a server. And that's pretty magical um, when you can do that. So one of the things we talk about in Quick is the idea of a unified execution model. And I can show you more of that later. But, and where's my slides? My slides disappeared. Oh, here they are. Anyways, that's kind of my talk. Hope you enjoyed it, and hope you kind of uh, seen the point of it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it.